Hello. Uh, today we are going to have a guest speaker. Uh, he is an expert on George Washington and Mount Vernon. He is my dad. He uh, is a historical interpreter at Mount Vernon, which is um, and it is so much higher than a tour guide who maybe just asks for tickets. He he has learned so much about the uh, estate here in Fairfax County of Mount Vernon. He has learned about specifically George Washington. He's learned about life in America in the 1700s. This is his job. He's required to be an expert at this, but it's also his pleasure. He's not going to be giving us just a, a tour of Mount Vernon today. You need to go there yourselves uh, more than once and see it for yourselves. Um, also, there's incredible websites uh, that Mount Vernon has set up where you can go room by room and even each specific object in each room has an explanation. Um, he is going to be telling us some things based on uh, student questions um, and uh, then he'll just say some other things he wants to be sure you know about. Uh, I will do a 30 second introduction of Mount Vernon. Uh, when you arrive, you'll go on up here and get your ticket and see a very good uh, orientation movie. And then you come on up and you can go here this way and go into the mansion or you can go along here and look at all these buildings from the 1700s showing what the buildings were like uh each like right there i remember is where paint was made and stored um here's the mansion that is just incredible to walk through different gardens the washington family tomb is over there on the right a uh, memorial that was built recently uh to remember the enslaved people who were kept there uh, here is a sample of the farm fields. It was a working farm and there's even a wharf or dock where you can go on a boat and go out into the Potomac River. Now on your way out, you better allow hours for these two incredible museums underground, by the way, that we'll talk about uh, towards the end of this presentation. And then you go on out through the gift shops and there's a couple of wonderful restaurants there too. So that's a big, big, big overview of a full big day at Mount Vernon. And now that you've got all that in mind, um, Dad, please go into some specifics. All right. Well, thank you. And um, hello, Greenbrier West. Glad to be with you today. And I'm very glad that you had so many great questions about Mount Vernon. I love it when students are interested in history. Several of the questions were basic questions about the house, who built it, when, who lived in it. So I'm going to start out um, addressing those. And we'll start with an easy one. Somebody asked when it was built or who built it. George Washington's father built the core of the house. Uh, Mr. Smith, do you have a picture of the various stages of the building? Up in the upper left is the house George Washington's father built. And that's what George Washington inherited. But then right before he got married to Martha Custis in 1759, he built up five bedrooms above stairs. So that's the top middle house that he invited his new wife into. And over the years, uh, right before the revolution, 74 and 75, you see the next two built out, the two wings, until it looked like it does at the bottom. Um, and that's what you'll see if you go today. And it is the original house. So I hope you get there. Um, one little thing I wanted to mention, just so that when you go with your family, you'll know something that they probably don't know. You notice how the house is very balanced. The right side looks just like the left side. Symmetry was very important. It was the style of the houses being built when George Washington built it. But he had to do a little few tricks um, to make it look symmetrical. You'll be going in the door on the left. You see the little window above it? You go through the door and glance back. You'll notice there is no window there. But there has to appear to be a window to balance the window over the door on the right. The two top left windows, 
that room you're going into has a 16 and a half foot ceiling. There's no room for a room up there, but they had to balance the two windows on the top right, which were the master bed chamber. So I think it'd be interesting for you to kind of drop that little bit of knowledge on your family. They, they, I doubt that they know anything about that. All right, who lived, uh, or when did George Washington live there was another question. Uh, he lived there from the time he inherited it at the age of 22 until he died there at the age of 67. That's 45 years he lived there. But they have to I subscribe. think, by the way, Dad, I think that we can take a close up here of that uh, lady and the baby we saw uh, in the earlier picture. Oh, look at that bib. My grandpa is a great historical interpreter at Mount Vernon. That's right. It's Mrs. Smith and my son, Benjamin, at an early visit there. I just thought that we should get a close up of that. And you were saying. I don't want to miss that. You were saying how long George Washington was able to live there. 45 years, but minus the eight years, eight and a half years actually, during the Revolutionary War. He got home only once in that long time. On his way down to the Battle of Yorktown, he came through Mount Vernon. In fact, we think he planned that battle right there. And that's something you should remember about George Washington. You know he wanted to come back to Mount Vernon, see his family and friends over that eight year period, check out the farm, how was it doing? But he didn't because he knew that his soldiers, his troops would also love to go home, see their family and friends, but he needed them to stay. So he shared their sacrifice and it worked. They saw that he wasn't asking them to do anything more than he was doing himself. So they became very, very loyal to George Washington. Then, during his presidency, another eight years away from Mount Vernon, and the capital wasn't Washington, D.C. then. He wasn't commuting up the Potomac. Um, the capital, first part of the eight years, New York City, the first year and a half, then Philadelphia, the rest of the eight years. So he was gone a lot during um, that 45 years he, he lived there. Who else lived at Mount Vernon? Well, when he married Martha, she brought two of her children with her. Actually, she had had four children, but two had died before her first husband died. When she married George, she had a four-year-old son and a two-year-old daughter. And actually the daughter died at 17 during an epileptic seizure. Back then the doctors didn't know how to treat epilepsy. And the son died at 27, but he had married and had four children and the Washingtons raised the two youngest grandchildren. This picture shows Nellie, the girl between George and Martha and Washi. It was actually George Washington Park Custis they named him after George. Uh, they called him Washi. Um, but he also died young. He died at the age of 27. But he had married and had four children. Excuse me, Washi, not uh, Jackie Custis. Sorry. The two children that Martha brought, uh, Patsy and Jackie. Patsy died at 17. Jackie died at 27. And these are two of their grandchildren that after Martha's son died, they raised the grandson and granddaughter. Uh, Nellie in the middle, Washi on the far right. But I think it's important for you to remember that the Washingtons were not the only family living at Mount Vernon. By the time he died in 1799, there were 317 enslaved people. That chart on the upper right shows in blue the number of enslaved people, red is the number of white servants, and just the few green people of the Washington family. So you can see that Washington was inhabited mostly by enslaved people. And I'm glad some of you asked some questions about them because they're often overlooked. Um, and in, they were essential to Mount Vernon. Without enslaved labor, there would not have been a Mount Vernon. And the most 
common question I get about the enslaved people at Mount Vernon is how did Washington treat them? Well, he would have, he thought he treated them fairly, but I'm sure the enslaved people had a very different idea about how he treated them. What's fair about being owned, having absolutely no freedom, no choices. But Washington's attitude, his thinking about slavery changed over the years. When his father died, <clears throat> George inherited 10 people, 10 enslaved people were suddenly his. He was 11, remember. So that's about your age. And you might think, owning people, I, I could never do that. But this is a different time. Most everybody he knew owned slaves. It was just life. But as he grew older, his thinking, as I said, changed, especially during the Revolutionary War. He spent most of the eight years of the war fighting in the North, where he saw they were getting along fine without slavery. At least their economy didn't rely on slavery. He had to have been aware of the contradiction, the disconnect between fighting for freedom and liberty and equality while maintaining slavery. And by the end of the war, he saw black soldiers fighting alongside white soldiers against the British, proving they were capable of a lot more than he had ever thought. He had always seen them as slaves and other soldiers. And he was influenced by close friends, such as the Marquis de Lafayette and Alexander Hamilton, who opposed slavery. All these things made him write shortly after the war, and I'm using his words now, that he hoped for a plan by which slavery in this country may be abolished by slow, sure, and imperceptible degrees. I hope it just fade away. But even as president, he never pushed for such a plan. He was afraid that forcing the issue would tear the states apart before they'd had a chance to bond as a nation. In the end, he freed his own slaves, <clears throat> hoping to set an example, but it didn't go very far. Even his wife didn't agree with him about owning slaves. Um, so in the end, slavery, well, slavery lasted another 50 years until the Civil War when the nation was nearly torn apart. Um, I, I give an hour long presentation on slavery and I think <laughs> this is very, very brief. So, but if you have questions, the Mount Vernon.org website has a lot of information. So I'd encourage you to check that out. Okay. I'll just point out that that's the memorial uh, at Mount Vernon uh, built kind of recently, I'm sure the last 20 years or so. And uh, on the bottom right there in that slide. 1983. So more than 20. Uh, and before we go on to the next uh, topic, a little, little bit of um, scraping and shuffling noises on, on your end there, uh, Mr. Smith, if you could be sure to uh, be keeping things away from the computer and not moving the uh, computer, please. Um, all right, next topic. All right, what happened to the house? After he died, ah, <laughs> it didn't go well for the house. He willed it to his nephew, who willed it to his nephew, who willed it to his son. Three generations of nephews who obviously were not able to take care of the house. This is in the 1850s, and you can see it was falling apart. If you go to Mount Vernon now, you'll see this stately house with the piazza with state, these beautiful pillars. Can you tell they're being held up by ship's masts? The whole thing was caving in. And a woman from South Carolina, <clears throat> Anne Pamela Cunningham, decided that if the men of the country couldn't take care of Mount Vernon, the ladies would. <clears throat> Excuse me. And she founded the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. It took seven years to raise the $200,000, a huge amount of money right before the Civil War. But they bought it in 1860 and they still own it. They're still restoring it. But think about it, 1860, not a good time to start any kind of enterprise right here in Fairfax County. The following spring, shortly after Virginia seceded from the Union, 
Federal troops occupied Alexandria, which comes right up to Mount Vernon. Confederate troops massed at Manassas Junction, only 25 miles west of Mount Vernon. Both battles of Manassas at Bull Run shook the windows at Mount Vernon. The whole area was devastated, ruined, destroyed by the war, but not Mount Vernon. Both sides, the North and the South, revered George Washington. They greatly respected him. So soldiers from both sides were welcomed at Mount Vernon. They weren't supposed to bring their weapons. Actually, they weren't supposed to wear their uniforms, but a lot of them had no other clothing. So they borrowed shawls to cover their uniforms. And the ladies held on for the four years of the war. And as I said, they're still holding on. And I just, in case it's necessary to point out, I want to make the point that it was remarkable, extraordinary that women did that. This is at a time when women were supposed to stay home, cook, clean, the only time a woman's name would ever be in the newspaper was when she got married and when she died. And yet, these women took it upon themselves and they succeeded in saving Mount Vernon and raising a huge amount of money. First of all, they had to convince the third nephew to sell the house to women. That was just unheard of. They didn't own property. My point is it was a very different time so it was all the more remarkable that women did this. Thank you. Right. Yes. There's a view from that piazza you were talking about. The, uh, you know, it's kind of a back porch, but piazza sounds much better. It's the Potomac River on the other side of that beautiful uh, hilly lawn there. And then the Maryland on the other side of the Potomac. Um, uh, there's Benjamin and Molly running around on it. Here's me about... 2003 or so uh now I, i'm showing this picture here just to show this back view of the house and here's the door that uh some tours will go into and and when you first go in you're in this central passageway that we would think of as kind of a hallway but the washington's entertained there because there was a nice breeze going through when you open both doors and mr smith what please what oh what is this object that's been there since George Washington was alive, and there's a picture of some fort-like building getting all right. bashed up there. What's that's that? The, that's the key to the Bastille, which is that uh, castle looking under it. The Bastille was a prison in France where the king kept people who didn't agree with him. And shortly after our revolution, and kind of based on the ideas and the example of our revolution, the French revolted. And one of the first things they did, they tore down the Bastille. And the Marquis de Lafayette who was only 19 years old when he came over here and from France and helped with our revolution, became very, very close to George Washington, almost a father-son relationship. He went back to France and was involved in their revolution, including tearing down the Bastille. And he sent George Washington that key as a symbol of liberty to the man he considered the father of all liberty. And the general was wow. so pleased by that gift that he put it in that case and it's been there over 200 years. Well, up until last night, because you know I love collecting historical artifacts and items. So last night I I broke in and I I helped myself to that amazing item. Sorry, couldn't resist. Hope you don't mind. Ha ha ha. Just kidding. It's a replica from the gift shop. Cool. All right. Let's see what we've got next. Okay, back to George. Um one question, what kind of education did he have? Not a good one. He called it defective. Um, defective means not good, uh, deficient. Most wealthy young men went to Europe back then. Uh, his older half brother, both of his older half brothers had gone to England, for example. But remember, their father died when George was 11. So they couldn't, math, they couldn't manage a 
European education. So he spent his whole life collecting and reading books. The picture on the right, the one on the left is him at 17. The one at the right is his library in the mansion at Mount Vernon. He had over 900 books, all kinds of books, but mostly nonfiction, a lot of how-to books and farming, military history. But um, he was self-taught for the most part. Another question, did he have wooden teeth? No, he did not. He lost most all of his teeth over his lifetime, eventually all of them. Uh, but his, so he had several dentures, but they were made of ivory or some animal teeth, human teeth, no wooden teeth. That's a myth, M-Y-T-H, um, one of several myths about George Washington. Another, have you heard about him chopping down the cherry tree? Never did it. Um, in the early 1800s, a minister, Reverend Weems, wanted to write a book about George Washington for children, and he wanted to teach them honesty. So he made up that story about chopping down the cherry tree, and I cannot tell a lie. A little bit of irony there. All right, another question. Uh, did he have pets? Well, yes and no. He had animals, he had lots of dogs, but he thought animals, like people, any animal, any person should serve a good purpose, um, be worthwhile. And so he had- And dogs. there he is. Hi, Mr. Smith, you just got cut off from us. If you could start over on the, uh, on the question, did George Washington have pets? Yes and no. He had animals, but he thought animals, just like people, should serve a good purpose. So he didn't have little pets on his lap, petting and such. He had dogs for hunting. He had dogs to keep rats out of the grain, the stored grain. They're called rat terriers. He had dogs to pace the carriages. Um, however, I, I made him sound very businesslike and not gentle. Listen to some of the names of his dogs. One was called Sweet Lips. I'm upset about that. A uh, Madam Moose, Tipsy, Mopsy, True Love. D don't you think those suggest that he was kind of, kind of fond of his animals? But um, you couldn't really call them pets. They served a purpose. All right, somebody asked about farming at Mount Vernon. Well, were there farms? How much? Uh, think of a football field from goalpost to goalpost. That's about an acre. Mount Vernon consisted of 8,000 acres. So 8,000 football fields. That gives you some idea of the scale. And about half of it was cultivated. Can you show where Mount Vernon was and what the rest of this tiny, tiny, tiny rectangle right there is a huge mansion, and all those side buildings that we saw earlier are right here. And when you go to Mount Vernon, you can walk down to the wharf that would have been right about here. So when people visit, they pretty much are seeing just this, and yet there was all this more owned by George Washington at Mount Vernon. But if you had asked George Washington what he did for a living, he wouldn't have said, I'm a general, I'm a president. He would have said, I'm a farmer. And he was an innovative farmer. He was using fertilizer before most, rotating crops so that it didn't wear out the soil, crossbreeding animals. Um, he saw the future of the country as an agricultural power, and he was trying to show others the best way. He loved the latest technology, the, the newest, met best methods. All right. One student asked, a, uh, okay, all right, he crossbred a horse with a um, donkey to get a mule. But back to this question that it kind of intrigued me. Somebody asked, when George Washington was my age, 
What was you like? Actually, before you get into that, I believe we've got some quick bonus features that I wanted well, to do. We have show. time for that? Sure, sure, sure. To uh, because I'll do them really quick. To make sure that uh, students make the most of their visit, there were some things my dad and I uh, wanted to be sure that you notice that a, a, a lot of people don't. Visitors go to Mount Vernon, they're there for hours and they just don't spot these things. Um, first of all, the biggest, most important one, like I said, after you've done everything outside and you might think you're pretty much done and just walking back to the parking lot or whatever, you'll come in through a door and you'll be at the top of some stairs this is called the Education Center, and it's just a huge, fantastic museum, hands-on stuff, videos. Um, you'll want to spend two hours in there. And then over here is a kind of more quiet, fancy museum, but it's got hundreds of actual 250-year-old things from George Washington's time, even owned by him, that you really are going to want to check out. As you are walking into the education center right here, you'll pass by a huge face of George Washington, a bust of him. It's about six feet tall. And a lot of people just walk by, glance at it. <clears throat> but it was made in a very clever way so that when you move back and forth, watch what happens. This is a video that I did. My daughter Molly is in it also. Do you see how he's turned looking at me? And then when I walk, he's still looking at me. Do you see the head turn to follow me? Do you see the nose and the eyes are still facing me? But then I move over here and he's facing me again. And I'm not telling you how they did that. You'll just have to go there and see yourself. Bam. If you were on the piazza back then and you looked down here, you saw this nice, big, beautiful hill. Well, there's a wall hidden here because this ground is higher up and then shunk the wall. It's called a ha-ha wall um, because they didn't want sheep and pigs wandering up off the farm area into the house area. Um, the the they, they wanted it hidden, though. They wanted this wall hidden. They didn't want a big brick wall in the middle of this big, big beautiful hill. It's called a ha-ha wall. Uh, two reasons. Possibly because the animal would be, walk up to it and all of a sudden be like, hey, I can't go any farther. And the humans would go, ha-ha. Or it might have been that a human would be strolling along and not notice it in time and thud, fall off, and the people around would go, ha-ha. That's the two theories for why it's called that. <clears throat> here's my dad and my mom and Benjamin and right over here when you're in line to go into the mansion there are trees that date from George Washington's time if you look for signs for that you'll see them uh, and then we've got a close up uh, we're getting closer to the mansion here's Benjamin um, checking out his shadow this walkway leads to the kitchen. The kitchen was kept totally separate for three reasons. Um, if there was a fire, because they use, you know, fire for cooking, and if the kitchen caught on fire, it wouldn't destroy the whole house, just that separate kitchen. Also, in the summer, it got incredibly hot in the days before air conditioning, and they would, all that heat would stay there in that outside kitchen, and not bake the whole house. And finally, some of the smells with food back then were not fantastic. Uh, maybe the, in the days before refrigerator, maybe the meat didn't smell very good before they cooked it. Maybe even just some of the cooking smells were a little too strong. Three good reasons to have the kitchen as a separate building and the people could just walk under this covered walkway to bring the food in when it was done. And finally, uh, this picture shows what looks like the stone blocks that Mount Vernon, the mansion, is made of. But really, it was a clever thing where some panels of wood would be painted, and while the paint was still wet, they would throw sand at it, and the sand would stick. And it really does look like strong stone blocks, but it's really panels of wood that have to be replaced every few decades. Those are the bonuses that you can see you can't see 
a bull riding machine in the snack bar area. You can only see that if your grandpa works at Mount Vernon and invites you to cool parties after hours where there's bull riding machines at the snack bar. Just thought I'd throw that one in for fun. Now, Papa or Grandpa or Dad, what were you saying about George Washington as a boy? We don't know much. Uh, he was just another kid. Nobody was paying attention. Nobody was writing anything down about him because he wasn't famous. His family wasn't famous. He wrote no autobiography. Uh, <clears throat> so we sometimes think that he was born to be general and president. But no, uh, he had to, in fact, overcome a lot of difficulties. Uh, first of all, his father died when he was just 11. And that was the end of his formal education, as I said. But he overcame that. He self-taught. And he became a soldier in the French and Indian War. I won't say he was a bad soldier, but I will say he lost more battles than he won. But again, he learned from that. He learned how to lead men. He learned how the British fought which came in very handy 20 years later when he was fighting the British. Um, then he became president, the first president of the United States. What's not to like about that? Well, for one thing, what's a president? Nobody knew. He didn't know. His only script, his only clue about what a president is was in the Constitution. And there's very little written in the Constitution about how to be president. He had to make it up as he went along. And so, for example, today we have a cabinet. Nothing in the Constitution about that. But Washington had learned during the war to surround himself with good helpers, uh, officers that were very capable and could help him make decisions. So he surrounded himself with very capable men as in the cabinet. Um, Thomas Jefferson was uh, Secretary of State. Alexander Hamilton was his Secretary of the Treasury. He, he made up the rules and, and they worked and they set precedents for even now. Um, my point, I guess, is any of you could be a great leader. What did Washington have? Uh, well, he was smart. Um, he was brave. He was honest. But I think one of his best characteristics, his most important trait, he was unselfish. He thought of the country's needs before he thought of his own needs. And he, when he was most powerful, he gave up that power, returned it to the people. Not once, but twice. At the end of the revolution, Congress had no money to pay the troops, no power to tax, to raise money. And some of the soldiers with George Washington, even the officers, wanted to march on Philadelphia, the capital then, to demand justice. And they wanted General Washington to lead them in what would be a takeover of the new government. But instead, he convinced them not to risk the freedoms that they had just won. Not to have a military government, but a government of the people, for the people, by the people. Then, at the end of his second term as president, a lot of people wanted him to take a third or a fourth term, or even be a permanent ruler. This whole idea of electing a president every four years, once used to a king, that was weird. But he knew that as important as electing the first president was electing the second and then the third and peacefully passing power on. A revolutionary idea. All right. Well, I know that I haven't answered all of your questions. But if you have more, do you, can you put up on the screen? Uh, it's mountvernon.org is the, um, the website for Mount Vernon. Mount Vernon. Dot org, easy to remember, and you can explore there for a long, long time, or if you want to cut to the quick, aftermontvernon.org slash digital. 
and it has all kinds of games, quizzes, videos, interactive things that you could spend days uh, doing. So I hope I whet your appetite for going to Mount Vernon, but until you can go, and it won't be open till at least June 10th, um, you can discover it at home. Well, thank you, um, Mr. Smith. I just wanted to uh, say it at the, at the end as a nice little specific uh, thank you. You can see on this eBay page that there was a medallion put out in 1932 on the 200th anniversary of George Washington being born. And I went and got one, as you can see here. So I'll be giving this to you for your George Washington collection uh, next time I get to see ya. Um, as a thank you for doing this splendid presentation. So thanks Likewise. again and bye-bye. Uh,